quiet on the set. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Hello, everybody. I'm Dear Myrtle, your friend in genealogy. Welcome to the Greek Gen Study Group with Carol Petranik. We are so excited, Carol, to have you with us. And I knew you originally because you are a co-director of the Family History Center. It's in Kensington, Maryland, but it's called the Washington, D.C. Family History Center. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. And I'm delighted to be here. Thank you so <laughs> much for inviting me. Well, you are an experienced presenter. I have seen you at the National Archives um, giving presentations at their annual genealogy fair down in Washington, D.C. You've served there as a volunteer to help get papers ready to be filmed. And uh, you're currently doing some work at the Maryland State Archives. That's a Family Search microfilming project, is it not? It is. Family Search is microfilming all of the will and probate records that are resident at the Maryland Archives. These go back to, some of them go back to the 1600s, long before we were ever a country. So it's a wonderful project. There are four cameras there and several sets of volunteers. We also have community volunteers who serve as citizen archivists, meaning that they help prepare those records mm -hmm. to be digitized um, by the camera operators. It's, it's an ongoing project and a really important one. I hope they get, take some good pictures of my ancestors. Oh, they are. Because <laughs> they were <laughs> right down the street. <laughs> All right, you all may have noticed that old Mert's in a slightly different location. Um, I am in the Family Search Library in Logan, Utah. And I'm here today because I gave a presentation, uh, the, the, one of the monthly in-service lessons for the um, volunteers that work here. They call them service missionaries here and I think it's some 20 almost 30 stakes support this family history uh, center here all right a little bit of um, of uh, housekeeping before we go too much farther whoops that's Trello we don't need that one uh, we have a Google sheet as usual and Carol has stocked it well I keep coming up with that let's not do that one there we are. Ah, oh, that's your PowerPoint. I am so sorry, guys. Let's see if we can get to the right one. Um, hmm. Let me go to Trello. Uh, Carol, tell us a little bit about what you are doing uh, in your summertime vacation. You're going overseas again. I am going overseas again. Last summer, a colleague and I were at the uh, in Sparta at the metropolis of Sparta. Metropolis is, is a central office, which is akin to an archdiocese. Mm -hmm. And we were able to digitize the marriage records in Sparta for the region of Sparta, which is Southern La Laconia. Uh, those records went from 1853 and we digitized all marriages from 1853 to 1935. These were the index books where the priest would have a stack of papers and he'd write down John Smith married Mary Doe. So it's just strictly basic information. Mm -hmm. But I am going back next month and I will be digitizing all of the flat papers, the marriage documents that the priest used to create the marriage index books. Wow. This is uh, about 40 boxes. Um, we estimate maybe 80,000 documents, and they stem for the period 1891 to 1935. So I hope I can get all that done in two months. I'm uh, gearing up for it. I'm very excited about it. And this project is being sponsored by MyHeritage. So. so this is a marvelous project. And last summer, you couldn't tell. And I was a good girl and did not tell <laughs> what you were doing. Uh, we knew that you were overseas, but uh, we didn't know that uh, it was part of this My Heritage initiative. So kudos to Thank My you. Heritage. Yes. Kudos to My Heritage. They're doing an amazing job collecting records from areas of the world that previously um, had not been had not been accessed and certainly not been digitized. 
Awesome. You're doing many good things. It's, it's an honor to be a part of it. I hear you. Well, what I'm showing on the screen now, just before we go to your PowerPoint, is our uh, usual Google Sheet that we create for each of our study groups. And just a reminder for those of you who may have not yet attended one of our study groups, the Google Sheet can be downloaded. And you'll want to do this this week so that you can use some of the um, many links that uh, Carol's provided to you. And you can do it in open document as a PDF, Excel. But you're also going to want to download this next week because there will be additional things added. Now, um, I'm going to add the link to this Hangout once it's archived, should be done by the weekend. And the same thing for session two. And uh, the overview is the usual one. We've, um, this is from Family Search, the research process, one question at a time. Here are the links that Carol has provided uh, wow, including to your blog okay. and to a couple of others, it's totally interesting things. Um, it, it, this is Spartan Roots, your blog. Mm -hmm. Just a little shout out so they'll recognize that Thank and you. see it. Yes. And uh, then let me show you a couple of other things on this worksheet, um, Google Sheet. Um, this is a US record selection table and may or may not apply to the types of records or the names of records that are available in, um, in Greece, but certainly um, we will be learning the nom nomenclature from our uh, moderator. Um, we also have links to family search, a few record links, let me scooch over. Um, a research log form, a person checklist, uh, so that you can use this to really jumpstart your Greek research. Remember, you go to file, Cousin Russ giving you the link, and then download. And, or you can just add it to your drive and it's a copy if you keep everything in the cloud. Um, okay, Cousin Russ, can you give me the link to um, the Google the other form, the PDF form. Thank you. It's a uh, first link in the in the uh, uh, Google Sheet. Okay, can you give it to me, please? I'm having a little difficulty oh, okay. getting right. back and forth between the two uh, screens. Okay, hold All on. All right. Hold on. Hold on. Thank you so much. Carol, tell us what we're talking about this week and next week so people can get oriented. And by then, I will have it. Here's the handout. Okay. Absolutely. Well, today we're going to be talking about the U.S. record collections that you need to search in order to find the original name of your family, your original surname, and your village of ancestral origin. It is absolutely critical that you have these two pieces of information because <laughs> records in Greece are written in the name of the people before they Americanized or shortened their names, and they're kept by locality. So today we'll be talking a little bit about a genealogy toolbox, what things you need to have to prepare you to research in Greece, a tools, mainly language tools. We're going to be talking about some research strategies, and then we're going to look at the U.S. records that will help you find the information that you need to get that, to that original name and that original village. Okay, so we have this first, first of all, we had that um, Google Sheet, which we talked about. Then we have this PDF file that's in your Dropbox that you've shared with us. Now, where would you like me to be at this point? Oh, great. I needed Kleenex. I got paper towels. <laughs> it's okay. It works. <laughs> it works. It, I hope it's a bounty extra absorbent. The, the flowers are blooming here. So take it away, Carol, and I will do your bidding on the screen. Okay, great. So we're going to go, uh, let's see, about this webinar. We okay went there. Uh, next slide is the research process. All right, let me, let me get that. I'm having trouble getting over. I don't know sure. why. There we are. <sighs> Not quite there. 
That's okay. All right. I'll chat for just a minute while you're pulling up research process screen. Um, okay. My research is in the area of the Peloponnese, the region of Sparta. That's where my grandparents are from. In fact, all four of my grandparents came from two villages right there adjacent to Sparta. So that is the nexus of my research. The uh, information and the links and some of the examples that I'm going to be showing you this week and next week are based on my personal research. However, it doesn't matter where in Greece your family is from. The record collections are going to be the same. The types of records that were generated are going to be the same. Mm -hmm. Our methodologies, our strategies are going to be the same. What's going to vary is maybe the dates of these record collections. So um, in some areas of Greece where there were um, many invasions and perhaps much burning and destruction of records, those records may not go back as far as maybe in areas where they were relatively, the people were relatively left un, un, unharmed mm -hmm. um, and the records pretty much are set. However, what we have to remember is that Greece, even though we have thousands of years of glorious heritage, we did not become an independent country until after the revolution of 1821. So consequently, prior to then, we were under a myriad of rules. We were under Byzant well, we were under Ottoman rule. We were under, some of the areas were under Venetian rule, Frankish rule. People were coming and going in this country. Consequently, uh, records may be in various languages. They may be in Turkish, they may be in Venetian before 1821. Uh, so we will see how far we can get back. Hopefully we can get you back to 1830 so that you can at least find your, your um, ancestors to the beginning of the government. When you go back prior to that, you're getting into different record sets that may or may not be available. And that's when we start digging into other resources such as village histories. Okay, next slide. Okay. So our Greek genealogy toolkit is uh, language is language based. If you are like me and you went to uh, Greek school when you're a child and you goofed off like I did and you <laughs> goofed around in your book and drew mustaches on the little men in the in the pictures, it's time to pull those books out if you still have them and refresh your memory you do need to have a basic knowledge of the language in order to be able to, um, to, to be successful in, in your research. All computers have languages resident in their software. So whether you have a PC or a Mac, you can go into the languages session, section and you can activate the Greek keyboard. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you can just you can just Google how to do this. It's it's very simple. Uh, just do a Google search. It'll walk you through step by step. Whether you have a Mac or a PC does not matter. They all have languages resident within them. I went to Amazon.com and for under ten dollars, I was able to purchase these transparent, sticky. Uh, little stickies that fit on your keyboard so that I can see which Greek letters correspond to the English letters on my keyboard. And that makes it very easy for me to go back and forth between Greek and English. And if I'm typing something in Greek, I just switch to the Greek language. I look down on my keyboard and I see exactly the letters that I need to, that I need to type. Mm -hmm. um, in week two, we will have for you a Greek genealogy word list uploaded. And that has all of the genealogical terms that you'll need um, with their Greek and their English equivalent. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So the translating apps, Google Translate is going to be your new very, very, very best friend. There are apps for your phone and there are also extensions that you can download from the Mac store or from the Google Play store so that you can have an icon at the end of your URL bar that is a translating app. And what you will do is when you go to a page that's in any foreign language, you just click on that little icon and the page automatically translates into whatever language you prefer. For us, of course, it would be English. Mm -hmm. So tra Google Translate is the most popular one. If you have a Mac, you can use iTranslate. Uh, and so that will greatly 
enable you to easily go back and forth between the two languages. Mm -hmm. If you want to get your language skills refreshed, there are a couple of websites on this slide. I personally have just subscribed to Greek Pod 101, and it's proving to be extremely helpful to get my language skills back up to where they need to be so that I can sound semi-coherent uh, when I set foot um, in Athens next month. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Every researcher needs a guide, and we are so fortunate that Lika Katsaikis, who has been a Greek researcher for over 50 years, has written a comprehensive book called Family History Research in Greece. There is a free PDF of this book that is resident on the Family Search Wiki, and Cousin Russ can put that link up for you. It's also a link in the Google spreadsheet. This book will be your Bible. Uh, it, it, it has all the basic information that you need to be able to understand how to do research in Greece. It also has a little, a little mini uh, historic section, a little section about customs, about um, language. But the most popular and the most important chapter that you're going to use in this book is chapter eight, which is called um, Research by Mail. What Lika has done is she has created form letters in Greek and a corresponding form letter in English with blanks. So you look at the English version, you're writing a letter to a mayor, you're asking for a, a mail register. And so you just kind of follow along in the English. Okay, here's the blank space. This is where I put the name of the person and you write it on the Greek form. This is where I put the date, you fill in the date on the Greek form, etc. And you send it off by email or you send it off by mail. Um, this is just a fabulous resource because many of us um, struggle to create uh, a coherent letter and these are all written for you. This is a terrific, terrific book. Next slide. The Family Search Wiki is your next best friend. So you have Google Translate or iTranslate, you have Lika's book, and you have the Family Search Wiki. I am so totally impressed with the work that Family Search has put into their wiki. Over the last couple of years, they have people who are assigned certain um, sections of the wiki to populate it, to update it, to keep it updated, to put in links, to put in historical information. Um, I did do some help on the wiki page for Greece, and I am really proud of this wiki. It is phenomenal. You can see on your screen that there are research strategies for beginners. There are links to different record types and historical information. There are also uh, links to online records, which is the little blue link in the lower left. Um, there are not too many online records in Greece itself, and we'll be talking about them in depth next week. But there are some, and there are also online records in the US that will help you with your Greek research. So please, please, please um, use the Family Search Wiki, and it will be a tremendous help to you. Um, next screen. So we Greeks, we Greek Americans, we Greek Canadians, Greek Australians, we are people with a very long and a glorious, glorious history. We have to remember though, what we call history, our ancestors knew as current events. Consequently, we have to understand the times that our ancestors lived in. We have to understand what life was like for them, whether it was in the 1800s or the 1900s. We have to understand the history, the economic situation, the political situation, because these are all factors that had a huge bearing on them. Um, whether they stayed in the country, whether they left the country, if they left the country, where did they go? When did they leave? And also, who did they leave behind? It's interesting to look at records and see how some children, especially the girls, may have left the country and others remained. So who chose who's going to go and who's going to stay and why did they leave? There are many history books, next slide please, that will help you with this. A simple Google search um, on Greek history, especially history after the Byzantine period, will be very important for you to know.
Okay, so jumping on in, we are going to look at rule number one, which is, in capital letters, you absolutely must, beyond a shadow of a doubt, know the original surname of your family. And it is not Pappas, and it is not Poulos. Those are names that have been redacted and Americanized by your ancestors after they left Greece and they arrived in their new country, in their new home. Now, Greek names are very descriptive names. They may look long and complicated and they may be hard to pronounce, but each name has a meaning to it. And I wanna take just a moment and help you understand this. If we look on the slide and we see not just Pappas, but Papayanakos or Papayanaku. First of all, you're gonna notice that there's a slight difference on the ending for the male and the female ending. However, let's pick this name apart. Akos or Aku means son of or daughter of. So that's a suffix that's put on the end of a name. Yanis or Yana, Yanis is the name John in Greek. So, Yanakos means the son of John, or Yanaku means the daughter of John. Papa, at the beginning of a name, means that somebody in that family had been a Greek Orthodox priest. Consequently, the word Papa is put at the beginning of the name, and then the patronymic, the name of, of the father, and then the name of the, uh, the ending whether it's a male or female name. So Pappas was shortened from Papayanakos or Papadopoulos or any one of a number of names. If we look at the word poulos, we can see that's also a suffix. It's the son or the daughter or the family of Alexander. So Alexandropoulos means we are the, I am the son of Alexander or I'm the daughter of Alexander or, or I'm the family of Alexander. Now, what the Greeks did often when they, especially in the U.S., was when they shortened their names, either they cut off the front of it or they cut off the back of it. So the Pappases took Papa, added an S, and cut off the rest of the name from, from that point forward. The Pouloses cut off the beginning of the name. So if you have a Pappas or a Poulos or something akin to it, Remember, that is an abbreviated name from either the suffix or the beginning, the beginning of the name. I also want to point out, and I know Mert will chuckle and so will Cousin Russ, names were not changed at Ellis Island. That's a whole other lecture for a whole other uh, time, but I do have to emphasize that um, the immigrants changed their names after they arrived in their new country. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about Greek names, there are some important things that, that you need to realize that it took me many years to learn. Greek names are not only descriptive, but there are some very common practices that go on that are going to frustrate you and complicate your research. So we're gonna to try to get these taken care of right here and now. The first thing we need to understand is when you go to Greece and you meet somebody new, they say to you, Boseleno. That translates to what do they call you? It is not what's your name. What's your name is Dina to Onomasu. But they're not asking you that. They're saying, Boselena, what do they call you? So this gives you license to name yourself anything you want. Uh, with Greek naming traditions, there, as many of us know, there could be many young children running around a village with the exact same name. Uh, Ioannis Mahalakakos, John Mahalakakos, because of naming traditions. So um, if you have four or five cousins and you all have the same name, you're going to start to distinguish yourselves. If you don't do it yourself, maybe some of the villagers will start to distinguish you. Which John are you? Oh, you're the John with long legs. So you get a nickname or a paratsukli. This happened in my family. My grandmother's name is Arida or Aridas. And the first time I went to Greece, the archivist said to me, that is a highly unusual name. It is, it's just not a name. What we learned is that it's a nickname. That the original name of the family was Mihalakakos, but one of the people running around the little village had very long legs. So they started calling him Long Legs. And that nickname stuck. Uh, took. It stuck and that he became known as Arida and consequently that was accepted as his new surname. So beware of Baratsukli or nicknames. They are rampant. We already discussed the fact that um, 
names can also be created through patronymics, which is the father's first name. We mentioned that in the slide before. So we have Kostakos, the son of Kostas. There are many, many Kostases in Greek. The name in English is Greek, is uh, Gus. So if we have the son of Kostas, it's Kostakos. If we have the family of Elias or Lois, another very popular name, it's Iliopolis. So there may be a Kostakos all over Greece, but that does not mean that they're related to you by blood because it's a patronymic name, not a bloodline name. Now we have families who decide that they're just going to, I just out of the blue, choose a completely different name to go by. And I have a personal example of this. My mother would keep telling me about a man named Kolokotas who was related somehow to her family. They called him uncle. They had no idea how he was related to them. Well, I found him in US records and I'm trying to find him in Greek records and I'm not being very successful. And I'm thinking to myself, he's from the same village. Why can I not find him? So last summer, I happened to mention this to one of the family members in the village when I was visiting. And she said, oh, Golokata, that's a Paratsukli. His real name is Lambropoulos. But we called him Kolokotas, and I'm like, oh my goodness, no wonder I couldn't find this name. So somebody may just be take another name as a nickname, or they can even use two names interchangeably. Um, next slide, please. So how are you going to know if any of these unusual naming traditions went on in your family? And the way you're going to find out is you're going to ask. You're going to ask. The, hopefully the oldest people who are living in your family. Hey, did we ever use nicknames? Was anybody ever known by a nickname? Was this always our family name in Greece? The other thing to be aware of is if your name is a patronymic son of Kostas or son of Elias, you're going to know that's probably not the original name. So as you start doing your research, you're going to um, be aware that that you may find another name in that village that is your real name and don't be shocked by it. Now, this is a really important clue to remember. When you're looking in Greek records, if you get to village records and you find your surname listed only once, that should send off bells, whistles, and red flags because families settle villages together. And it's highly unusual that there is only one surname of a family in a village. If you find that, it means one of a couple of things. Number one, it could be that that name was a nickname. It could be that perhaps the person who is in that village, maybe one of his ancestors or his father or grandfather may have killed a Turkish tax collector and had to flee the original village and went someplace far away so he couldn't be found. This is not an unusual story. This happened all of the time. Um, when you find original records in Greece, you may find records that have two names on them. Also, tombstones may have two names on them. Next slide, please. And here is a perfect example. I found Kolokotas on a tombstone. Oh, by the way, when we talk about Greek cemeteries next week, look at the photos on here. These are uh, very common to find in Greece. It's wonderful not just to have the names, but to actually see what these wonderful people looked like. So this tombstone reads Ikos is the first word, which means family, and underneath it is Konstantinos and Lambropolo. So that is the family name. Now where the red arrow is, you see that name repeated, Constantinus Lambropoulos or Kolokotas. So this is an example of the, how wonderful that whoever had this uh, tombstone created went ahead and put the two names that Constantinus Kolokotas uh, used. But notice underneath his wife's name, she is, her last name is not Kolokotas, it's Lambropoulou. So this verifies what I had learned that Kolokotas was indeed a nickname or a powered sukli, and it was not the, his original name. Mystery solved. Next slide, please. So for rule two, you have to know the exact village. As I mentioned before, families congregated and created villages. If you have a village with a saint's name, which probably 99% of them in Greece are, there are going to be dozens and dozens of villages in Greece with the same name. 
when I learned that my family came from Ios Ioannis, I was very excited. Hey, I have the name of my village. I go to the map, I look at Sparta, which you will see in the lower right-hand corner, and I think, oh my goodness, there are three villages with the same name in close proximity around Sparta. Which one is my family from? So you not only need to know the name of the village, but you need to know the region. And if that village was close to a major city or a major region, uh, that makes it very helpful. So as you're digging around, try to find out when you hear just the name, oh, where, what city is it close to? What's another village next to it? So that you can pinpoint which St. John's is your exact village. Is that like the fan club except at the village location? level? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, next slide please. So I put in a slide here with the question or the exclamation point or just the comment, why these first two things are first. So I want to reiterate, please remember the original surname is what's written in the records in Greece, not the Anglican or the abbreviated name. And there is just a small little cutout there of a name written in Greek, which is the full name. Remember that records in Greece are sorted by locality. They're kept by locality. They're very location specific, which is why you must know the village. But the third point, the third bullet point, is that unlike us here in the US or in Great Britain or other areas of the world, there is no digitized website where you can go like a family search or my heritage or an ancestry and type in Abraham Lincoln and have all the Abraham Lincolns in that database come up. There is nothing like that in Greece. There are very few records in Greece that are named digitized. So consequently, you can't just do a general search and start looking to see, oh, maybe this is my family, maybe this is my family. You have to be much more specific. So you have a lot to do and you're going to need help. And how are you going to get it? Next slide, please. Many of us now are taking DNA tests to help us find new cousins. And for those of us who are Greek, this is really, really, really an important thing to do. More and more Greek people are testing with any of the major testing companies. And they're finding, to their great surprise, cousins, sometimes third, fourth cousins, oftentimes, especially if you test with ancestry, where not too many Greek people test, you may get cousins in the fifth to eighth range, which is really, really hard for us, because many of us can't get our trees back far enough to find cousins who could be in the fifth to eighth cousin range. So we are really looking to try to find second and third cousins, maybe fourth cousins, where we know that we can connect our trees with them. Sometimes when families came to a new country like mine did, the families, the sisters and the brothers were very, very close. They lived in the same neighborhoods. They associated on a daily basis. But then things started to happen. Families started to grow. Maybe one branch of a family left, went to a different part of the country, and the families began to lose touch. I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled, last week when I got a DNA match with a second cousin who I realized was my grandmother's sister. And we were able to start comparing information. Unfortunately, I had not known about this family because they had moved to a different area and my family had lost touch with them. So please take a DNA test and you will be hopefully as thrilled as I am to connect with somebody whom you can discuss your personal family with. Also remember your new DNA cousin is going to have relatives that you don't know. Maybe um, you'll be able to find information and share uh, with him. One thing that I would recommend also, uh, no matter what company you test with, please upload your DNA results not only to GEDmatch but also to MyHeritage. My Heritage's database is 90 million, with an M, million people. They are huge. 53% of their people are in Europe. So if you're looking to connect with people in Europe, you want to go to a website that has a strong European presence, and that will be My Heritage. Next slide, please. The other way to get help is to please, please, please join our Hellenic 
Genealogy community. The Facebook page is Hellenic Genealogy Geek, G-E-E-K, not Greek, but geek, sort of like a computer geek, because okay. we're all genealogy geeks. I'll put a link in the chat right now. Please, thank you. This website, three years ago, we had 2,000 people. We now have 18,000 people. There are a lot of people out there who are just like you and just like me, who are trying to find their Greek ancestry. And because we're all in this together and we understand the challenges, we do everything that we possibly can to support and to help each other. People will post a query. Um, does anybody know this family, um, perhaps in this village or in this area? I don't even know where they came from. And members of the group will jump in and they'll say, I recognize that surname, or they'll post a link to an area in Greece where that surname is, is, could possibly be found. Or they'll say, uh, I think that name may be in my village. I'll ask my uncle who still lives there. You're going to get a tremendous amount of help. So please join us on Hellenic Genealogy Geek Facebook. And if you're a little hesitant to use Facebook with all that's in the news right now, just set up a separate email account that's not linked to your personal stuff and join anyway. You really do need to be with us so that we can help you. Next slide, please. Okay, so moving on, our mission now we know very well is to find our surname and our village of origin and you're doing everything that you can do. Uh, you're talking to people until it comes to the point in my family where they were like, oh no, she's going to ask us more questions. Please don't ask us any more questions. We've told you everything we know. But you're doing your best. You're looking at documents and now you have got to start looking at clues. Next slide, please. And those clues have to be the records that are resident that the people had in the last place that they lived. So if you're Greek Canadian or if you're Greek American, you have to look at the records in Canada or in the US or in Australia if that's where your ancestors live. Those are going to be your clues. You also have to look at every possible record collection that your ancestor may have been mentioned in. And we're going to discuss today um, those that are bulleted on this particular slide. We're also going to have a case study of a family to see how their three brothers filled out the exact same records and how they did it differently. Next slide, please. So our low-lying fruit, our most, our chance for success is to find census records. And most of our ancestors immigrated around 1900, maybe late 1890s to the 1900s. Most of them were here by the 1930s, surely by the 1940s. And that's the perfect time frame to be looking at these census records because they ask specific questions about immigration and naturalization. And those are the questions that we're gonna zero in on because they're going to lead us to the records that we need to search next. Next slide. So here's an example of a census record. This is 1920. This is my grandfather, John Kostakos. He lived in Brooklyn. And you can see in bold uh, next to his name that we know now he immigrated around 1900 and he's an alien. Not from outer space, but an alien, meaning that he had not yet begun the naturalization process in the United States. So I know for my grandfather, I'm not going to even try to find a naturalization record for him before 1920 because he was an alien in the 1920 census. One other thing I want to point out that is rampant in census records is the um, inexact an incorrect name, writing of names and also the indexing of names. We are used to now getting on a search engine and typing in the name the way our family spells it. But they may, may not have been the way the family spelled the name initially. And, or if it was not written well, it may not be the way the name was indexed. So when you go to type in Kostakos, you may not find it. However, what we need to do is be patient. We need to realize that our name could have been spelled many different ways. Write it out phonetically. Make a list of all the different ways that your names could be spelled. Learn how to use wildcards and start plugging those variant names into, the, into your search engine with the liberal use of wildcards. And hopefully you will get lucky and you'll find it. So let's look at my grandfather here. 
okay, he's an immigrant, 1900, he's an alien. I'm looking at his family and I'm thinking, wait a minute, maybe there was somebody else named John Costacos in Brooklyn in 1920, because my grandmother's name was not Mary and their first son's name was not Tom. Mary's name was actually Hariglia, which is my Greek name. Tom is actually Andrew Andreas, that's my father's name. And I'm thinking to myself when I first saw this a long time ago, oh my gosh, what, how did this happen? Well, I would imagine that when the census taker knocked on the door, my grandmother could not speak English, that maybe she got her neighbor to help her answer the census taker's questions. When she said her name was Hadiklia, the neighbor couldn't pronounce Hadiklia, so she told the census taker it was Mary. And maybe the census taker said, name the children in the family, and she knew there was an older boy, and she called him Tom. I don't know how those names got on the census record, but that's the way it looks. So if you see a record, and it looks like it's your family, but there's something wonky, look at the big picture. If the ages correspond, and especially if the head of the household seems to be your person and the other information lines up, chances are that that could very well be your family. Next record, please. Marriage records. You have got to get both a civil marriage license and the Greek Orthodox record because both of them have differing information. Next slide, please. This is the civil marriage record for my maternal grandparents. You will see that he did use his full Greek name, Papayanakos, and my grandmother's maiden name, yay, Eftaxia, is written on the marriage record that was filed in City Hall. We also learn here from this marriage record a um, little information about both of them, including their father's name and their mother's maiden name, which will help us when we go back to Greece. We also see here a date, and I have this in red for a specific reason. This date says May 10th, 1914. Next slide, please. Now, when we get the church marriage record, we get more information and, ah, oh, a different piece of information. On the church marriage record, we get in Greek, the village of origin. And this one says, Ios Ioannis Sparta. We also have the name of the family written in Greek, the way it would be written in the Greek records. We also have the village of origin for my grandmother, Mista. Her name with her father's name, again, the, uh, the original name. But now we have something very curious. We have a date that does not make sense. What is 27 slash 10 April? What this is for Greek people or people of the Orthodox faith is that that's telling us this church in 1914 was still following the Julian calendar, not the Gregorian calendar. Pope Gregory um, was the one who started the Gregorian calendar and there's a long history behind that that I don't have time to get into. And he was a Catholic Pope. So the Greeks aren't gonna follow the Catholic Pope. They kept the Julian record and they kept using that Julian record in Greece and even in many of the immigrant churches way up until the middle of the 1900s. So consequently, there's a, there's a delay of days. There's about a 10 day difference between the two calendars. And when you take into effect leap year, we find that in the Greek church, they were married on one date. In the civil record, they were married on another date. That is the Julian calendar. Don't let that throw you, but do be aware of that. Next slide, please. You can also find original surnames, although you are not going to find villages in baptismal certificates. And this is my baptismal certificate when I was a, a child. So you will see in Greek on the left and in English on the right, you're going to see the name spelled in Greek, and you're also going to see the name spelled in English. You're also going to get the name of the sponsor or the godfather. So any kind of a Greek Orthodox church record is well worth trying to access whatever time or trouble it takes you, because you are going to get the original name and through the marriage record, the original village. Next slide, please. Okay, we're going to move on to immigration records. Now, if we remember back to the census records, it gives us the year of immigration. And this will help us narrow down the period that we're going to look for passenger ship records. 
there were some immigration laws that were passed uh, in eight, starting in 1891 where the federal government began to federalize or standardize immigration procedures, which also includes the passenger ship records and the records that were, um, were created at the time the immigrant arrived. If your immigrant arrived before 1906, there is not going to be as much information as after 1906. So hopefully they came after that time period where you're going to learn from the immigration passenger ship record, the birthplace of the immigrant and the name of the relatives that they left behind. One thing I do want to point out about my heritage, next slide please, is that they stitched together these passenger ship records. Now this one is an old one for my grandmother. You can see there are two separate documents that I put together on one slide. But what my heritage has done is they've gone through all the passenger ship records and they've taken page one and page two and put them together, which makes it so much easier to just read across the line instead of going back and forth. Now this is my grandmother, Arida Hariglia. Um, she was 18 years old and we see in her passenger ship record 1913, so it's after 1906, that she leaves her mother, so now I have her mother's maiden name, we have her village of birth of Iosioanis. She also came, uh, she's going to her brothers in New York. So these records are extraordinarily helpful. Um, my grandmother did not travel alone on the ship manifest. There are several other family members and people in her village who came with her. So when you find your ancestors passenger ship record, look at all the names on that manifest and see who they came over with. Next slide, please. Naturalization records are gold mines for those of us who are researching our immigrant ancestors. There were two steps that an alien had to take. Within, uh, after two years of residency in the United States, they could file their declaration, meaning that I declare my intent, I want to become a citizen. Those are called the first papers. And if you see those on a census record under the immigration column, if they filed a first paper, it will say PA for paper. That will be the, the um, uh, abbreviation. Then after three more years, they get to file their petition. They petition the court that says, I've met these requirements. Now I want to become a citizen. This is a copy of my grandmother's naturalization certificate that was found in her papers. Um, hopefully you will see this in your family papers. If not, uh, there will not be a way that you can get a copy of this unless you go to, uh, unless your ancestor had an alien registration file. Next slide, please. So this is the declaration of intention. And on it, we see that my grandfather gave his full Greek name, Ioannis Andreas Kostakos. What thrills me about this is I now know his father's name is Andreas. So in the Greek records in Greece, I am going to look for Andreas. He also gives us um, his birth date and his birthplace, his village of origin actually is in the first column. Uh, now, village of origin may not necessarily mean birth village. It could be the village that, they, that he originated from when he left the old country. So if you're a grandparent, you may see emigrated from or origin. That could be that he was, had left the port of Piraeus or left the port of Patras because he had been working there for a few years before he came to America. Don't take that as being the birthplace. Look for something that specifically says village of birth. And here on this record, it is given as Ios Ioannis, so I know for sure that that is my grandfather's village of birth. Next slide, please. This is my grandmother's petition for naturalization. And we see that she's naturalized um, under her American name, Angelina Pappas, not Ageliki. Papayanakos. It's her American name. We have here her birth date and her birth uh, village of origin. We have her husband's name. We also find where he was born, when he was born, and we find that he had died by the time my grandmother naturalized. So a very important information. Um, we also get the name that she immigrated under the name of her ship that she immigrated under and her date of immigration. So if we first started with a passenger ship record and we didn't find her, 
Now, on her petition for naturalization, we can go back and we can find her on that ship. So remember, these columns on the census records are very, very important. Moving on to another record set, which was not that familiar to me when I first started my research, but now I realize how critical these are. These are called A files or alien registration files. At the beginning of World War II, the United States government, um, as a national security measure, required that anybody in the United States who was a foreigner, who was age 14 or over, who was going to stay in this country longer than a month, had to register with the government and had to be fingerprinted. The 1940 census is a critical key to help you understand, next slide please, if your ancestor was an alien. If they're listed as an alien in the 1940 census, they had to fill out an alien registration form. 5.6 million aliens filled out these forms. That was 5% of the population of the United States in the 1940s. They had to carry their cards at all times. And the National Archives in their catalog makes it name searchable so that you can go in, type in a name at that link, and see if your ancestor did have an alien registration file. If they did, you can order it from Kansas City. Next slide, please. So what's in these files that makes them so important for us? Anything you would want to know about that alien, if indeed they filled out a form and if indeed they do have a file. You're going to get their naturalization documents, you're going to get marriage certificates, um, documents from births, from family correspondence, you're going to get a list of every place they lived in the United States. Um, in that file. So here is an example of a form for my grand aunt, Bertha. We already see at the top of the form that she's giving us three names that she had used, Manos, Costianos, and Costas. We also see her date and place of birth and her arrival information. Now, it turns out that Bertha's file had 48 documents including all her naturalization papers and anything else we would want to know about her and about her family. So these can be found online again at the NARA catalog. And there are also some links in the spreadsheet that will help you learn more about these important files and will help you order your alien registration file from Kansas City. Moving on to social security applications, there are two types. Many of our um, ancestors, even though they were immigrants, could apply and they did apply for social security. If they paid taxes, they could get social security. They did not have to be naturalized. And just like today, you don't have to be naturalized to collect social security. There are two types of social security applications and you need to get both. The first one is the actual form that your ancestor filled out. This is considered a primary source because he or she filled it out themselves. It has all of their information that you would want to know, their original name, their place of birth, their parents' names as well. However, it, this is just the first form. As people's names changed, as things happened to them and they needed to update their social security information, that's kept in the computerized social security extract, which is different from the original application. So you will want to order both, next slide please, and you will also want to order these for your ancestors' siblings. And we're going to do a, slight case, a small case study here to help you understand why it's important to research the brothers and sisters, not just your own ancestor. So on this social security card, you will see for women, you're going to get their maiden name or their previous married name, their date of birth, the names of the father, the maiden name of the mother. And if this is a male, you're going to get his wife's maiden name. Next slide, please. So let's look at this case study for the Babetzos family. There are three brothers. This is not them. I pulled this off, a, off a, an internet because I don't have a picture of all three of them together. But let's see how they filled out their forms. So we're going to start with James John Babetzos. He has written his name as James John. 
So based on Greek naming principles, we can assume that James's father's name is John. Next slide. This question asks for his name at birth, and he writes Demetrios. So now we have his original first name in Greek, Demetrios. Next slide. We can see that he's 62 years old, and we have his date of birth. Very helpful for us. Next slide. And here, he filled out his place of birth as his village, his district, Theologa Celestia Laconia. Perfect. Exactly what we need to know. Demetrius Babetsos was born in Theologo Celestia Laconia. Next slide, please. This also asks for his father's name. He writes his father's name, this is interesting because he mixes the Greek and the, and the, Anglo, uh, the English, as John Demetrios Babetsos. So considering the naming traditions, we now know that Demetrios is John's father's name and James's grandfather. We've gone back two more generations just on James's social security application. Next slide. It also gives asks for the maiden name of his mother. We can read Costandina, but the last name is a little smudged, so we don't have that. Okay, well, the second brother is Thomas. Let's see how he fills out this card. He just gives his name as Thomas, but also I wanna point out that this card looks a little different from the one that James filled out, and that's because these cards changed over time, and so the information has changed. Now, Thomas writes his place of birth as Sparta, not Theologu. I do this myself all the time. I come from Silver Spring, Maryland. If somebody says to me, where are you from? I say Washington, D.C. area, because nobody knows where Silver Spring is. So Thomas did what I and maybe even you continue to do. He gives the nearest largest city of birth. However, I want to point out, if you are researching Thomas, and you only looked at Thomas and you did not get the information for his brother James, you would assume that Thomas was from Sparta and he was not from Sparta, he was from Theologos. Next slide, please. John confirms his father's name was John, but he doesn't give us a middle name. But we see in his record, his mother's maiden name is much clearer. So now we find her name is Linardes which clears up the, the mystery that was in James's record. Next slide, please. This is the record for the third brother, the oldest brother, Sam. Well, Sam has Americanized himself. His name is Sam Best. His place of birth is also Sparta. And he has taken the liberty of Americanizing his father's name to John D. Best. He confirms that his mother's name is Costandino Linardes. So next slide, please. We can conclude that the father's name of these three boys is John in English, Ioannis in Greek, Dimitrios Babetsos. We can confirm that the mother's name is Costandino Linardes, that these boys were all born in Theologos, not necessarily in Sparta, but in Theologos of the region Sparta in Greece, and their grandfather's name was Demetrios. So this case study illustrates how absolutely critical it is for any of us with immigrant ancestors to look for the records for their siblings. You're going to do not just one search, but you're going to do multiple searches so that you can be sure that the information you have is accurate. Because if you don't have accurate information, if you thought that that family came from Sparta and you're going to go overseas and you're going to spend time and money to research in Sparta, you are not going to find that family because they're in Theologos, not Sparta. Okay, next slide, please. Moving on to some military records. Did you know in World War I, 95,000 men born in Greece registered, had to register for the draft? There were actually three drafts in World War I, but by the time they were all aggregated into record collections, there winds, winds up to be records for all men between the ages of 18 and 45, whether they were U.S. born or foreign born. If your ancestor was in this country by 1918, he would have had to fill out 
a World War I draft registration card. And this is what it looks like. It has um, some information. Uh, it does give us a birthplace. This particular um, ancestor of mine put his birthplace as Sparta, not his original village, but at least we've got a region that we can start to determine, okay, he's from Sparta. At least we know he wasn't from Athens and he wasn't from Crete. We know the area he was in. But also very importantly, it does give us a citizenship and he was an alien. Next slide, please. For World War II draft reg registration cards, we are especially interested in looking at the fourth registration known as the old man's draft because it registered men that would be our grandfather, or if you're younger than me, your great grandfather's um, age would have been, if he had come to the US in the early 1900s, he would have been eligible and would have had to have filled out a World War II draft registration card. So these cards um, are important for you to look at. Over 10 million men are registered for World War II draft. These again, both native and foreign born. This is an example of my grandfather's card and you can see that he does give his full name, including his middle name, which gives me the name of his father. It also, he said here that he was from Sparta, Greece. It does give us a birth date. The other thing I wanna point out is that be, don't be a little distressed at all if you find varying birth dates for your Greek male ancestors. Most of them did not really know exactly when they were born because the celebration in Greece is the name day. The name of the saint after whom you were named is celebrated, not a birthday. So for my ancestors, I have found, I think what happened was somebody said, what's your date of birth? And they just made something up because it varies according to month. It varies according even by years for the same person. So look at the big picture, not just the specific fact to say to yourself, that couldn't possibly might be my grandfather because it's a different birth date. Most likely he has many birth dates. Next records, uh, next uh, slide, please. Moving on to death records. Death records in the United States will be also give you clues um, and surprising clues sometimes. If we look at this slide, you see this is my grandfather, Louis Papas Papayanakos, the one that we were looking at earlier with the marriage um, uh, records. And on his tombstone, his Greek name is put, not Papas, which was the name he went by. So you never know what you're gonna find when you start digging into these records, but death records are very, very helpful. Next slide, please. There are many types of death records. And a death certificate is the first thing that most of us are going to go for. I want to make you aware that uh, watch out for the name of the informant, who was the person that provided the information in this red box when it asks for not only the person's name, but his father's name and his mother's name and where they are from. Uh, this was my uncle Nick, my uh, mother's brother, who gave this information. He's the informant, and he got some American, inf some records uh, information right. Uh, he gave uh, my grandfather, Louis, his father's name is Peter Pappas, which would have been Panayotis or Petros Papayanakos in Greek, but he gave it in the American name. At least I had something to go by. He also gave his mother's maiden name as Catherine Elacotis, which is not really her name, but it's close enough that it gave me a clue as to where I could start looking. Next slide, please. I am wondering if any of you have ancestors buried in Greek sections of a cemetery, because if you do, you definitely want to look for cemetery records. In Baltimore, Nicholas Previs worked not only with the Greek church, but with the Woodlawn Cemetery in the Greek section there. And he created a list, next slide please, of all of the people who were Greek who were buried in that cemetery. He merged the church records with the sexton's records in the cemetery. And this is an example of a page of his book. The original name as found in the church is the name on the top. The name in brackets on the bottom is the way the name was spelled at the cemetery, at the, the interment records, the meaning the name that the family used in America. 
just take a look at this one page and you will understand why you can't find your people. They changed their names. And even the same family may have changed their names to a different Americanized version. We see that when we look at um, Conidiziotis, Demetrios, his name is spelled with a C, that's no problem with a K, but also named as Conitz, C-O-N-I-T-S. So he took the original Greek name, he started to Americanize it, and then he shortened it. Um, look a little bit farther down, Conidiziotis, two down from that. Same name, but this man's name is Peter Covetus. So, this is why you have to be patient. This is why you've got to find all these records. These people did Americanize their names and not all the same Greek name was Americanized to the same American name. Next slide, please. Looking at obituaries, sometimes you can get lucky as I did for um, Elaine Morfogan. Her name in Greek was Morphogenes, so the Morphogen is very, very, very close. But in her obituary, I find her village of origin, uh, she was born in the US, excuse me, I find her parents' village of origin and also the names of her father. They are from Anavriti, another little village outside of Sparta. Next slide, please. Find a Grave is becoming a really, really important website. Please don't overlook searching for your ancestors and find a grave. They've become almost memorial sites for the deceased. It used to be it was just a tombstone picture, but now people are updating photos of their, uh, of their ancestors. Next slide, please. As well as obituaries and other information about the person. So this is Charles's Find a Grave page. We have not only his obituary, but we also, at the bottom of his obituary, have links to other family members, to their tombstones. You can link on that, you can click on that link. It will take you to his mother, to his father, to his sister, with obituaries and information about them. Billion Graves is another site that uh, is now affiliated with MyHeritage. So what MyHeritage is doing is they're giving you not only the information at, uh, for the tombstone, but they're also giving you links to records on MyHeritage with that name. So if I find George Christakos and I click on his name, next slide please, I am going to come up with a page that says, oh, we have all these records for George Christakos. So that gives me an opportunity to research him further. Next slide, please. And when I do click on, start clicking on those names, I find many different types of records, whether it's the same George or a different George, I have to put on my detective hat and find out. But I'm coming across let record links to a phone book, a newspaper, a yearbook, and many, many others just by searching on Billion Graves. Next slide, please. The um, funeral home register and cards are also ways that we can expand and find the fan club of our ancestor. And this is very helpful for us. So if we have a funeral home register that maybe our aunt has or our uncle has or our grandmother, we can take our smartphone and we can snap a copy right then and there at our relatives' homes. And by expanding to the fan club, we can research, know who else we need to research as we're, we're moving in on that ancestor and especially if we're starting to hit brick walls. Next slide, please. Funeral home records are surprising to me. They give you a lot of information about the deceased, but they will also ask about the, deceased par the deceased's parents and their birthplace. So don't overlook the records of the funeral home. There are so many other records that we can research and that we should be researching. We certainly can't forget photographs and the information on the back of them as well as any other documentation that may be in the home of um, our relatives um, or our cousins. And you know, when homes get split up, 
the documents get split up. Somebody will say, well, I'll take the pictures, and somebody else will say, well, I'll just take the papers. And so you really do need to get reacquainted with your cousins, find your new DNA cousins, and get anything that could possibly exist for your family. So in summary, we have covered so much today, but I just want to summarize that we are all going to get our toolboxes filled with the tools that we need to help us get over our fear of the Greek language or over our elementary Greek and be able to look for records in Greece. Um, we are going to work together and collaborate together on Hellenic Genealogy Geek. And remember one thing, that we Greeks are a very social people. So we are very big in the social media world. Um, we have uh, many of our people overseas in Greece have set up Facebook pages for their villages. So once you find your village of origin, join that Facebook page and start asking questions. Use your Google Translate to translate a question from Greek into English. Post it both in Greek and in English because many young people overseas speak English very, very well. We're going to take a DNA test and we're going to find all these new cousins who are going to help us locate more information about our family. We're going to find as many sources as we possibly can to verify the often conflicting information that our immigrant ancestors gave. Part of that, as I said earlier, was lack of knowledge. Part of that was their unfamiliar unfamiliarity with being in a new country. Um, they were asked questions here that they were never asked in Greece. So we have to put ourselves in their shoes. We have to understand who they are, and we have to say to ourselves, you know, I understand why my grandfather had four different birth dates, because they never asked for a birth date in the village. They celebrated the name day. We're also going to research family members, and we've seen from the case study how important that is for immigrant ancestors. And the last slide, please. So next week, we are going to look at the records we're going to find in Greece. Um, I hope that by next week, you will have taken some of these language tools that you've downloaded a translator, because when we're going to go to record collections in Greece, they're going to be to Greek websites, so you're going to want that translating app on your um, laptop or on your desktop and on your phone so that you can learn the language a little better. We're going to talk about the different types of records. We're going to talk about where they're held and how you can access them. I'll also tell you a little bit about what you need to do to plan a trip to Greece. So I want to thank you so much for joining me. And Pat and Russ, are there any questions? Um, anything I can answer? We have had quite a I feel like the information has come so quickly. I like that the father's name can be the middle name. That's mm -hmm. very helpful. Um, and I like that you explained the conundrum over the actual date of birth. Mm -hmm. All kinds of people are responding mostly to us as panelists, saying this was a wonderful presentation. Now, I'm committing to all of you, I'm, I'm going to be leaving Logan in a in an hour or so and zoom will re uh, they kind of have to it does this thing to process this recording so by friday i will have this up but you've already got the links folks because mm -hmm. carol has given it to us you've got the pdf file and I, this is just i wish i had greek ancestors now <laughs> <laughs> i wish you did too we may be we would be cousins <laughs> we would be we would be it's there awesome. was one there is one thing I do want to point out. I know we're over our time limit, but the handouts, the PDF handouts, they have um, they have the uh, links in context. So um, if you want to know a little bit more about the passenger ship and the naturalization alien registrations, be sure to don't just look at the link that's on the uh, spreadsheet, but pull up that handout. It's a downloadable PDF and it's hyperlinked, and mm -hmm. that's where you're going to find your links. Okay, thank you. Um, I also noticed that people were asking about um, specific websites and how do you do this and that. Well, each website has its own methods and those are things that are not within our um, time frame to be discussing. So like how to upload your tree to MyHeritage, which I agree is essential. MyHeritage is 
bigger outside the U.S. than ancestry is inside the U.S. So, absolutely, absolutely. And each, I'm sure that um, I and I can help respond to these questions um, on the chat. But each each website will tell you exactly how to upload your your tree mm -hmm. to there. And you just Google it. Just say, "How do I upload a tree to my heritage?" And boom, the search yep. will you know the answer will come right I, up. I put the link to that handout that you just mentioned in the chat for. Okay. I have one one short question. I think mm -hmm. I know the answer, but I, up front you talked about what you were called. Oh, Barcelona. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of that was communications person to person. Mm -hmm. Did it, that also translate into the documents that we will look at next week? In other words, could you find that you were called by? all of your names mm -hmm. speaking, but a record might have the name different. Uh, we will certainly look at records that have two names. Okay. Yes, right. absolutely, absolutely. So while we had a second, I was just going to show them what the Hellenic gene uh, Genealogy Geek site looks like on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is uh, click to join. I've Absolutely. already joined. That's how I know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then <laughs> here is the uh, HellenicGenealogyGeek.com website. Mm -hmm. um, that's f there's that link to that marvelous uh, PDF file, which you've already given us the link to. Correct. Um, anything else before we go? People are sharing. Um, what I do, uh, Carol, uh, since the beginning of the year, is I take the video, mm -hmm. embed it from YouTube, and bring all the comments in and post it on my blog, and I'll give you that link so okay. that uh, you'll have that. Uh, most people are saying, well, my father was born in this place in the late 1800s. Wonderful presentation. A um, couple of people have people born in the same place. Oh, like so they're village. meeting each other on the Yes. 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 So, so that's funny. like a bingo right there. Wow. Absolutely. Oh, oh, way good. Now, just as a quick um, bit of housekeeping, those of you who have um, registered for this um, session are going to get a reminder for next Wednesday session, but I will also post it uh, in Dear Myrtle. Carol posts it over in that Facebook group. Uh, over on um, the, the Hellenic uh, Geek mm -hmm. uh, Facebook group, um, also on Twitter, mm -hmm. also in our Google Plus community. So I just put a link to where the conversation will continue once we've done the, this chat. It'll be in Google Plus. There's mm -hmm. a link. Mm -hmm. I just, I love that they know their villages, Carol. They're yes. like, that's half the battle. That's half the battle. Absolutely. And go to your Facebook page and, and find your village on Facebook and join. It's amazing how wonderful people are to share. They want to share and help each other. It's just, it's just awesome. a beautiful community. Thank you it so is. much. Well, it's awesome to have had you here. I know that uh, Cousin Russ needs to get off uh, mm -hmm. line quickly because he's going to be teaching this afternoon. Now I'm going to um, stop the recording in just a minute and then we'll be in the post green room. Please don't say anything until I tell you that the recording has stopped. But uh, there's nothing left to say. I, uh, behalf of Cousin Russ, I'm Dear Myrtle, your friend in genealogy. Kudos to Carol for helping us today. Thank you. Yes, happy family tree climbing, everybody. That's a wrap. <laughs>